Hey everyone, I'm Bluey, and my first Kingdom Hearts game was Dream Drop Distance. Please help me. Kingdom Hearts started off as a way for Square Enix to compete with Mario 64 with Disney and Final Fantasy characters in one big crossover game that the whole family can enjoy. And then the original story got really emo, and complicated, and time travel, and was spread off against multiple games, with multiple systems, with multiple gameplay styles. The point is, the franchise is really complicated. As the internet probably already told you. Unless this is your first video on the internet, in that case, I'm really sorry. Well, Kingdom Hearts 3's got me in a Kingdom Hearts mood, so let's take a look back at the franchise. Back when everything was simple and clean, I am not sorry for that pun. Cheesy puns aside, before we head into the game, let me clarify my stance on the Kingdom Hearts series. I'm a casual fan who enjoys the characters and gameplay, with the story being something I'm on and off again, mostly from a consumer's point of view of you having to buy like all these games to understand one game, which I really don't like. So, of all the pre-rambling out of the way, Kingdom Hearts 1. Let's play it. Also, warning, I'm not going to summarize the entire story, I might leave a few details out, so just saying, if you said, ah, oh, you forgot this thing, well, I warned you. We open with a copyrighted music video by Utada Hikaru called Simple and Clean, which is a nice tune, and the animation during it is really good, except the things going on doesn't really relate to the story much, it's just kind of nonsensical imagery for the sake of nonsensical imagery. Heck, there's barely any Disney stuff in it, so how are you supposed to get hooked on the Disney aspect of the game? In the tutorial section, we get to pick what to specialize in, strength, magic, or shield, which does affect how soon you get certain skills in the game, so pick one that will work best with your playstyle, except magic, never pick magic. We find some shadow creatures and wake up on our home of Destiny Islands. So that was an okay tutorial with a bit trippy and nonsensical, so let's get introduced to our cast of original characters made for the game. We have the main character we control, Sora, and his employee number 131313, Kairi, the girl who needs constant saving, and Riku, Square Enix Edge Boy number infinity plus 7. They live on Destiny Islands, which makes up the next 40 minutes of tedious gameplay, doing fetch quests while fighting kitty versions of Final Fantasy characters like Waka. Here I am, Fuzzy Bear, to tell you jokes both old and rare. Waka, waka, waka. Ah! I will say that as much as I don't like the fetch quests, they do serve a story purpose. That being that Sora, Riku, and Kairi are building a raft to go off the Destiny Islands and explore other worlds. The night before, the trio of anime kids leave the island. Dark creatures known as the Heartless attack the island and Riku gets extra emo. When you try to save him from drifting into some black goo, he disappears, but you get a weapon, known as the Keyblade. A silly concept, yes, but the Keyblades you get throughout the game look really cool, so I don't mind. We use the weapon to fight off the Heartless, but it's too late as Destiny Islands is the darkness's lunch. Quite a hefty lunch if I do say so myself. Sora ends up in Traverse Town where he meets Final Fantasy characters like Yuffie, Aerith, and Squall who was called Leon for some reason, who also lost her will to the darkness, because apparently if you lose your will to the darkness you could end up in Traverse Town. Or you know, you could die either way. Sora encounters Donald and Goofy while clearing out some Heartless, and Donald and Goofy have actually been looking for Sora, as in a letter by their king, Miska Muska Mickey Mouse, he told them to find the key, and since Sora has a keyblade, he must be the key the king was referring to. Donald and Goofy have been looking for the king, and Sora agrees to join Donald and Goofy on their quest to find the king, hoping to find Riku and Kairi along the way, as their episodic adventures through the Disney worlds begin. The opening section of the game gives me mixed thoughts. I hate the stuff at Destiny Islands, but I like the stuff at Traverse Town. So really, we're starting up the game with a mixed impression. Before we head into the Disney World, let's talk about the gameplay. Kingdom Hearts 1 is an action RPG where you control Sora with his Keyblade as you slay Heartless and explore Disney Worlds with Donald and Goofy as AI-controlled companions. The combat is excellent, starting off basic, but as you level up and progress, you get new magic attacks like Fire and Blizzard, you get the ability to summon Disney characters like Simba and Tinkerbell, and you get AP points they can use to improve combos and access special moves like Sonic Blade. While Donald and Goofy's AI aren't the best, you have enough versatility with Sora where that isn't an issue. Unfortunately, the weakest part of the game comes in the exploration and platforming, thanks to the one-two punch of the clunky way Sora controls while jumping and the frustratingly designed platforming sections, making these parts the worst in the game. But now that I got my general praises and complaints of the gameplay out of the way, let's go through each Disney World one by one and give them a rating of fun, eh, and never again. 
But wait, how do we get to these Disney worlds? Through the Gummy Ship, which plays like Star Fox on a budget, and I don't hate it. It's as good as Star Fox, and Kingdom Hearts 2 and 3 improves on the Gummy Ship gameplay vastly, but it's mild fun and a nice way to break up the gameplay. And at least it's more fun than the frustrating platforming you have to do. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for, a Disney World! We start off with Wonderland from Alice in Wonderland. The world is a balance between combat and platforming, though said platforming can be really frustrating as I mentioned before. Though I really like the story of this world. It's a basic retelling of the source material, but it captures the charm of the Wonderland characters really well. Though some of the platforming sections hamper the fun of Wonderland, so this gets an eh. Olympus Coliseum from Hercules, probably the smallest world of the game, but one of the best, as it focuses on the best aspect of the game, the combat, and we get some fun interactions with Phil, aka the Danny DeVito character from Hercules. Also, Cloud from Final Fantasy VII is here for the fangirls to swoon over. Also, this world has the most replayability in the game, as, as you progress through the story, you unlock more tournaments and bosses throughout the game. Unfortunately, one of those bosses is... The God Demon! D Olympus gets a fun. Deep jungle from Tarzan blows. You have to go back and forth between the campsite and Tarzan's home like five times throughout the world, with very annoying platforming sections in between. Though I like the story as it develops Donald and Goofy along with telling the Disney World story, which not many worlds do. But I'm still gonna give this a never again for how tedious it is to play despite some decent storytelling. We take a detour back to Traverse Town to get a ship upgrade where we find out Riku is alive! And is working with the Council of Disney Villains led by Maleficent. I'm gonna give my thoughts on Riku out now, and he's a jerk. He's working with the villains to save Kairi and gives no care about Sora because he thinks that Donald and Goofy have replaced him and Kairi. Except, Sora says straight to his face that he befriended Donald and Goofy to help find Riku and Kairi, making Riku look like an idiot and a jerk, who basically abandons his best friend bro because he's going through puberty. Luckily, we get to ignore all that teenage angst and move on to Agra from Aladdin. It's a basic level, but it's still quite fun. Something I want to bring up about Agrabah is how fluidly the genie is animated in the cutscenes compared to anything else in the game. Now, there is still some good animation, but at times it does feel like a puppet show. Uh, without Wilkins killing Watkins, of course. Got your parachute? I forgot it. How about the Wilkins coffee? I forgot that too. <sighs> You'll never forget this. Monstro from Pinocchio has more Riku being a hormonal jerk, but hey, at least the visuals are wacky and you get high jump, which makes platforming a hell of a lot easier. It's another fun world. Atlantica from The Little Mermaid has horrible underwater controls that feel very awkward, a mediocre plot, and shirtless Sora, so never again, Square! I said never again! We follow the worst world of the game with the best world of the game. Halloween Town from The Nightmare Before Christmas has interesting visuals, an original story that fits well with the original film's characters and tone, and barely any bad level design, which makes it a fun world to visit. We end the main Disney worlds with Neverland. We actually don't explore Neverland, but we explore Captain Hook's ship, which is still an enjoyable time with fun flight controls, which is the only good state-specific gimmick in the game. And we got Captain Frickin' Hook. How could you hate this world? Now I know what you all may be thinking. What about a Hundred Acre Wood? Well, it's an optional world, and it's way different than other worlds since it's a minigame collection rather than a world where you fight the Heartless. It's fine enough, and Winnie the Pooh is my favorite of the Disney properties in this game, so I'm obligated to love it either way. And now we go to Hollow Bastion, where Maleficent has kidnapped all the princesses of heart, which include Kyrie, and with all the matter heads, Maleficent can go super, I mean access the darkness so she can take it over. But Riku stabs her in the back. Or is it Riku? Riku has been possessed by Ansem, a scientist who studied the Heartless and the titular Kingdom Hearts, and has now become a Heartless himself, and has used Riku's dissension into darkness for a new body rather than his previous Mr. McCloak form. After fighting Maleficent in her dragon form, all the princesses are saved, but now we still got ants in the face, where we do so at... THE END OF THE WORLD! The end of the world is a test of everything you learned throughout the game, ending with the final boss battle against Ansem. 
At the end of the battle, Ants have opened Kingdom Hearts, thinking it's darkness, but oops, it's actually light. Killing him off until the Dream Drop Distance came in and threw 5.5 monkey wrenches into the plot of the series. But, oh no, the doors are closing, and if not closed, the Realm of Darkness will invade the Realm of Light. And we need people on both the Realm of Light and the Realm of Darkness to keep the door shut. Who will do it on the Realm of Darkness? Well, other than Riku, actually redeeming himself by being on the Realm of Darkness side alongside Mickey Mouse, who closed the door on the Rumble Darkness side, while Sora, Donald, and Goofy do so on the light side. And now everything is hunky-dory. But, Pluto has an envelope that the gang chased into a GBA game later remade for the PS2. And that's Kingdom Hearts 1. It has its rough patches mostly at the beginning of the game, but if you could power through them, it's a fun time. Help that the final mix editions for the PS3 and PS4 add more replayability with new bosses and even cutscenes which help flesh out the story. It's a good start, but other games like Kingdom Hearts 2, Birth My Sleep, and 3 are much more enjoyable, but this ain't bad either for the start of the series. Kingdom Hearts 1 gets a 7 out of 10. Well, I covered the first one, everyone's gonna ask about the others. I am not looking forward to 358 over 2 days. Yes, that's the actual title of the game, help.